So for those of you who just joined us, thank you so much for coming today. Um, you are in Zoom land um, and you are at the third um, kind of instantiation of this larger conversation that the Annenberg School is having on um, thinking about race and the way that it shapes um, us as scholars, communication scholarship, and many, many, many um, of the important issues that we are we are tackling um, within this school and beyond. Um, and today I am so, so thrilled uh, to have uh, Dr. Khadija Ferryman um, to engage us in this conversation and to share a bit about her really, really exciting research on thinking about health science, health technology, and the perpetuation of racial inequality today. So um, what's going to happen now is that I'm going to introduce um, my friend Khadija and a little bit about her research. And then we'll just kind of have a conversation um, about uh, some of the things that I find really, really exciting about her work, some of the things that um, I really think are important for this community um, to hear about the things that she is thinking about um, in terms of her research topics, the substance, the methods. Um, and then before I really get into that conversation, or I should say, and then after that, we'll have um, some questions. Um, we'll have time for questions. And for those of you who were able to see the slide that was up before, um, just if you could feel free to put any questions that come to your mind in the Zoom chat um, during the conversation, that would be really helpful. I'll do my best to kind of incorporate those as we go. Um, if you would like me to read your question completely, feel free to type the entire thing out. I'm happy to use my voice um, and to, to read those questions for you. If you'd rather voice your own question, which is also very, very welcomed and encouraged, you know, we're a relatively um, smallish group today, or, you know, a good sized group, but, you know, a manageable size. So if you'd like to use your your own voice, you can just kind of uh, indicate in the chat that you have a question and I'll be happy to, to kind of call on you um, at the end um, when we have some time for question and answer there. Um, so before we get started um, with our guest of honor today, um, I just want to thank um, all the folks who make these conversations on race possible, our Dean um, John Jackson for convening them, um, Deborah Williams uh, for coordinating these events, and also our very capable and incredible um, IT staff who are at the ready if you have any questions. Um, please feel free to actually can can one of you unmute and maybe tell me who who should people contact if they have issues in this hi um yeah anyone who has any technical issues can contact me or anna gamarnik and we will you know you can direct message us here in zoom or on teams and we'll try to help you out as quickly as possible awesome all right thank you so much andres and mm -hmm. to Okay, um, so let's get started. Uh, I can't wait to tell you all about uh, our guest today and to have her talk about her research in her own words. Um, I want to introduce um, Dr. Khadija Ferryman. So Dr. Ferryman is currently the Assistant Industry Professor at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Um, and as of next academic year, she'll be moving to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health as an Assistant Professor there in their Department of Health Policy and Management and also at the Johns Hopkins um, Berman Institute of Bioethics. Her research investigates the co-production of race and the science and technologies of healthcare. Um, really steeped in her background as an anthropologist, she uses ethnography to investigate the development of precision medicine, genomics research, electronic health records, and many other technologies that we'll be talking about today um, to understand how different professional and expert cultures navigate the politics and ethics of our increasingly data intensive healthcare settings. Um, and beyond tackling these kinds of big theoretical questions that are at the heart of various academic fields, including um, communication, um, bioethics, science and technology studies, anthropology, and many others, um, her research also illuminates the very concrete ways that science and technology can recreate racial health disparities. Um, even when these projects are explicitly dedicated or committed to improving these issues. Um, so I warned Khadija that I was gonna tell a little story about her um, and how we know each other at the beginning. I hope it won't be too embarrassing. Um, so Khadija and I know each other um, because we are both postdocs at the Data and Society Research Institute a few years ago. 
um, where she really spearheaded the Institute's agenda on health and health tech and racial inequality. Um, and when we started, I have this very vivid memory of us kind of navigating all of the different hurdles of postdoc life together and kind of being in this very um, stressful and exciting place and kind of being newbies in this environment together um, and me kind of griping to her about, oh, I, I got to navigate this new IRB and what is this IRB? And I'm having all these problems with this IRB and can you look at my application and all this stuff? And she was, of course, incredibly generous and would always kind of be my sounding board for any gripes that I had. And then I remember an email coming through, an announcement, um, an a, you know, a, a institute-wide announcement that um, Khadija was actually joining the IRB, joining an IRB of this huge and important um, precision medicine study, this nationwide, the largest nationwide um, precision medicine study um, in the United States. And feeling like, oh, wow. <laughs> um, so here I am kind of complaining to her, seeing us as like compatriots in this, you know, uh, stressful situation together. And then realizing how um, she was actually setting these rules, right? That she was in the position to use her expertise in this way and review proposals from, you know, not necessarily scientists just like me, but other kinds of scientists who are interested in using different kinds of data and feeling amazed, um, not only by her expertise, um, and, but also to her, um, by her commitment to actually making these communities better and not just kind of talking the talk of this research and really understanding these things analytically, but also walking the walk um, and really getting involved in these issues um, as a scholar. So we'll be talking about both sides of, um, of her research like uh, in, that, in that same mode today. Um, so what I wanted to invite um, Khadija to do first is uh, to kind of introduce us, um, for those of us who might be less familiar with her research, um, to all of your different research areas, kind of give us an overview of the things that you're interested in, um, what you see your major fields are, and then afterwards, um, to tell us about how you came to be fascinated by these things. Because I think it's, it can be really helpful for especially the, the PhD students among us to kind of hear a little bit more about how these things don't just like drop on us from the clouds um, and that they're kind of deeply embedded in our backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for that um, intro and story, Julia. Um, and before I get started, I, I also wanna thank Julia and Dr. Deborah Williams and the staff and um, everyone at Annenberg for uh, hosting me today um, for this conversation. Um, as Julia mentioned, we are friends in real life. So this is a real pleasure for me to um, spend this time together and engage with, uh, engage with you, Julia, as well as everyone um, out there in Zoomland as well. So, um, and, and yeah, and, and that story about the IRB will, will hopefully, we, we will, we'll get to, um, to that conversation around how I, how that happened, how I decided to do that, and because it wasn't a, a sort of easy, um, a sort of easy decision. But I'll start by giving an overview of my research. So, um, as you very uh, nicely and succinctly uh, described, um, I think about my research essentially focusing on the ethics and politics of health technology, right? Um, and for me where the ethics and politics of health technology, and, and when I say health technology, I mean specifically genomics, I mean uh, uh, electronic medical records, I mean predictive models that are used in healthcare, AI that are you know, used in healthcare. So these are the kinds of, and, and all other kinds of uh, digital health data um, that are relatively new forms of health data. So these are the kinds of uh, health technologies, I guess they're really more um, health information technologies that I'm interested in, really looking at the ethics and politics of those health uh, information technologies. Um, but for me, where the ethics and politics become really interesting is where they intersect with race. Um, because I do see uh, when these technologies begin to intersect with race, the ethical questions become really interesting and the political um, issues become really interesting. And um, I focus on how, uh, when, we look at, when we look at these technologies, how we can see uh, race kind of being made real, being made material, if you will, through these technologies um, and how race 
uh, through these technologies is sort of mediated um, as, as a category of risk as well. So it's really interesting because I think in this, at this sort of intersection of ethics of politics of health technologies and race, you sort of see race emerge in these different forms that I think are really interesting. Um, and then to sort of get a little bit uh, closer in, I think where I, I uh, where I get really drawn to the, the kinds of questions and issues that I get really drawn into looking at is particularly when these technologies are very specifically um, when there's hope around them and they're 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 framed and sort of um, uh, there's there's hope around how they can specifically address health disparities, right? So there's some health technologies, of course, that are uh, new and being developed um, that may not have a kind of health disparities focus, um, an explicit health disparities focus. But I think it becomes really interesting when you sort of combine, when you see this combination of the hope and hype around these new technologies and with the hope of, okay, we can use these technologies to address health disparities. So I think you uh, see this really interesting kind of flavor of technological optimism when it's, uh, uh, the, the, the hope is how we can kind of apply these theory, these uh, technologies to begin to address health disparities. And that's where I see, again, some of these really interesting sort of manifestations of race, these really interesting mediations between race as a category, between race as risk and these technologies. Um, so it's really kind of that intersection that I think is really interesting. And just to give you some concrete examples of how I've looked at that. So in my dissertation, um, so I, I kind of looked at this issue in a couple of ways. So for my dissertation research, um, I conducted an ethnographic study with scientists, physicians, research staff, community advisors, um, and, and was really on the ground with them for a number of years uh, while they were grappling with the issue of how to use genomics to address racial disparities in health. So uh, there have been a, a couple of sort of recent discoveries that of particular genetic variants that have these kind of ancestry or population connections. And so it's this very tricky area because on the one hand, these uh, ancestry or population specific variants um, are really promising because uh, they could be a way to sort of intervene um, in the health of a specific population if there's a, a, a genetic connection to, to a disease. And in this, in this case, it was a genetic variant that um, was found more often in people of African ancestry that increased the risk of end-stage kidney disease. And before this finding, there was already a health disparity, uh, racial disparity between uh, Black people and, and other groups and sort of their health outcomes when it comes to uh, end-stage kidney disease. So there was a lot of hope around, okay, if we we've identified this genetic risk factor, maybe we can actually intervene in this existing health disparity. But at the same time, right, these um, scientists, because I think of a lot of the good work that's been done by social science, social scientists, they knew that this was a very tricky area and sort of getting them into this potentially this minefield around race as a biological category, scientific racism. So it was really interesting to see how they sort of navigated between wanting to use this new variant to really address disparities, to really um, improve uh, you know, the health outcomes of people of African descent while not at the same time kind of uh, reinforcing some of these ideas of race as a, as a biological category. So in this study too, this is one of the examples where I saw kind of race in uh, kind of taking shapes in these multiple forms as a social category, but also as a kind of genetic category at the same time and how through the process of biomedical research, uh, scientists, experts, communities were trying to kind of move through that, um, move through these different categories and sort of use them in, in different ways. Um, and then for my postdoc research at the Data and Society Research Institute, um, I looked at some of the hope and hype surrounding precision medicine, which is a bit broader than genomics. Uh, precision medicine includes genomics, but also includes new forms of uh, digital health data, so electronic medical records, uh, environmental data. Also, the hope is that some kind of uh, data that's not considered uh, traditional health data, uh, like air quality, water quality, that all of these kinds of data could be combined to and analyzed to um, actually sort of learn more about 
influences on health, what makes people healthy, what, what makes them sick. Um, and here as well, uh, I, the, the focus was on sort of how a range of actors from biomedical researchers to software engineers, because with precision medicine, you have kind of this additional expert domain of software engineers coming in to build these predictive models, to, to gather these data, to, to put them together, um, to think about how these new data sources and these new analytical models, again, could be brought together to address, again, the sort of overall idea of what are the factors that make people sick and keep them healthy, but also specifically there are some racial disparities. Could this new uh, field with these new data sources and methods uh, make an intervention on some health disparities as well? Um, so that was my dissertation work. My current work, um, and we'll get into, I know we'll get into my kind of current work a little bit later as well, um, but it's it's still focused on the on the ethics and politics of of health information um, technology, and I'm still really interested in uh, precision medicine and precision medicine uh, research. And um, for my current work, I'm really interested in how uh, inclusion is being framed in precision medicine, especially as a way to address racial disparities in health, um, and how inclusion in large data platforms. What does that actually look like? Um, and and how how do those kinds of in data data intensive in, uh, practices of inclusion kind of bring uh, marginalized groups in in some ways and and potentially exclude them and um, and others? I'm also moving in some different directions, um, different but related directions. So um, I have a background in policy research. So I've been lately getting uh, more interested in sort of the emerging policy of this field. So. Initially, when I started researching precision medicine in 2017, it really was kind of a new field. Um, but now, almost four years later, you know, it's still emerging. It's still a new field, but there are some sort of policy and, and regulatory discussion is, is um, beginning to build in the field. And so I'm getting really interested in how these policy conversations are shaping up, what the regulation for this field um, is starting to look like, right? So it's a it's a it's related, of course, to biomedical research and governed by some of the, the more traditional sort of um, regu regulatory mechanisms that are in place. But because of this kind of confluence of these new data types and these new analytical tools, it does present, the field does present new regulatory and sort of governance issues that are, um, that I think are interesting. So I've been, um, I've had my kind of finger on the pulse of the policy, how the policy around the field is shaping up. Um, the other, um, Another couple of, of, of things um, that I'm interested in sort of currently, current and future as well, is I'm really interested in, and this is sort of related to the, the policy piece as well, um, in how when we get to kind of a national stage, there are um, national organizations that are focused on health disparities, um, focused on minority health, for example. And many of these groups are quite influential in developing policy, um, health policy for specific groups, et cetera. And so um, one of the areas that I'm going to be focused on in, focused on in the future is how um, these national minority health groups, kind of what their, inter, what their interaction and engagement is with precision medicine research and sort of how they're um, contributing to uh, some of the policy and, and data governance conversations there. Um, something that's a little bit uh, I think a little bit more uh, distinct from some of my current research areas, but that I'm, I'm um, really interested in is data governance. So um, there have been, so I've, I've looked at uh, precision medicine in, uh, in, in, the, in the government sector as well as in the private sector. And um, as some of you may know, uh, some of the big tech companies recently have been sort of turning their attention to health, trying to sort of break into the healthcare field. And recently, Google sort of got into some trouble because um, it was revealed that they were building kind of a very large health data infrastructure. And so there are, um, I'm really interested in the building of health data platforms, health data in infrastructures, and sort of what those look like. Um, there are these health information exchanges that are also really interesting. So I want to sort of kind of do some comparative work looking at um, looking at those. Um, that that also kind of comes from my interest in um, STS and the importance of sort of looking at infrastructures 
um, these things that may seem like they're kind of invisible, but actually exert a lot of power and allow some things and don't allow other things. So I'm really interested in sort of, you know, if we take the case of Google, for example, building a health data infrastructure, yes, it would be great for Google to build an interface where physicians, instead of the sort of clunky electronic medical records that they have right now, they would have a Google search bar where they could, you know, put in their patient's name and get a really nice, um, pretty kind of uh, search results, right? Um, but what does that mean when Google is the one that is uh, kind of creating and designing that, that infrastructure? Um, so that's another uh, area of, of interest. And I'm also really interested in health data cooperatives. So the other issue that's come up um, in this precision medicine domain um, is sort of where's the ownership for this health data. So when these platforms are being built, um, and this is something, of course, that's come up in other fields as well, not just with health data, you know, data are becoming, uh, are, are of course quite lucrative. So where, you know, what are the models for privacy and ownership for individual data? And there's a number of um, uh, kind of health data cooperatives. And so, um, I'm interested in sort of different kind of health governance models. That's pretty, pretty new though. Like I, I, I literally just know about a few of those, but that's something that's on the horizon for me, sort of thinking about alternative models for um, health data governance. Um, so that's the current stuff. Um, but I know the second part of your question was um, sort of how did I get here from anthropology, right? Um, and not, you know, a, it, not a typical path for yeah. an just to be doing the kinds of things that you're doing. And so I would love for you to, to talk to, to our, our audience about that. Yeah. And, you know, I think my, my professional career um, in general, it, all the dots sort of connect now, but at the time when I was doing it, they didn't, um, you know, they, it, they didn't really seem to be sort of leading up to one uh, straight path. But um, my kind of first career was actually doing uh, housing uh, policy research, specifically looking at housing discrimination, uh, racial discrimination in housing and what the impacts, uh, the multi, multiple impacts of that uh, were. And that's actually really when I um, really got interested in uh, sort of looking at race and health and different processes of marginalization because I saw um, in real time sort of how uh, the impacts of racial um, racial segregation impacted, of course, people's housing and um, and economic possibilities, but also literally, quite literally, their health and the health of their families and children, et cetera. Um, and uh, so that's where I really so I, I kind of started doing housing policy research, but connected that up to health, and then um, I majored as I. I I was an anthropology major undergrad, did policy research right after college, and then decided um, to pursue um, pursue graduate school in anthropology. And I actually started kind of uh, focusing on anthropology, if you can kind of think of it as like anthropology of policy, um, but connected that back to um, connected that back to health. And for me, you know, I when I say that I look at the ethics and politics of health technology that may not sound, they, that may not scream anthropology for some, right? For multiple reasons, right? One, because I kind of do, I study up, I do research with experts, I do research mostly in, you know, what we think of as the global North or the, or the West, and that those may not be typically kind of field sites or populations that people um, associate with anthropology. But for me, I see it very much in line, the kind of questions that I ask um, see it very much in line with um, an anthropological kind of focus because not to sound reductive, but anthropology for me is really about kind of studying power. So if it's anthropologists who are looking at kinship or ritual, it's really sort of looking at those things to understand how power works in a place. And so when I'm looking at ethics and politics of health information technology, it really is kind of a study of, of power. Um, and even the even looking at ethics, there's a long tradition in anthropology of anthropologists kind of trying to understand um, different moral worlds, right? And it's this kind of supremely human thing to do to ask, um, am I doing the right thing? Am I living my life the way that I should? And what are the things that are getting in the way of me 
um, potentially living my life uh, the, the way that I should. So this, so to me, I also see ethics as really like a, a core anthropological um, uh, domain of inquiry as well. Um, and for with with race, again, I also see that as very um, core to anthropology because, again, um, culture is typically you know the the kind of defining concept of American anthropology, but um, culture was really this foil to race in American anthropology, right? That it was like, okay, there's this idea of race as this unchanging biological category. Well, actually, there's this other way to think about human behavior, and let's think about it in terms of culture. So race has always been this kind of category that anthropology has engaged with. So I really see, like I said, even though the, the sort of domains and the populations that I engage with um, may not initially um, uh, strike them as kind of anthropological, um, I really do see them as, as really central kind of questions and concerns. And even the health information technologies themselves, right? They are a kind of artifacts. They are digital artifacts that you can look at, right? Anthropologists look at artifacts to understand the culture and society in which they were built and how those artifacts re you know, reflect and shape the culture. And I think we can look at that with health information technology as well as political artifacts, right? Like when we when we look at an EHR, what do we actually see? So, yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. I think it's it's wonderful to kind of think about the ways that um, these disciplines, which you know seems so steeped in a particular kind of history, perhaps colonial legacies of right, like all these different problematic ways that we've had to overcome as researchers in our own disciplines, um, and just the way that you narrate the power of the kind of essential tools to do things that might be counter to the original kind of intention to those um, to those disciplines, the, the founders of the disciplines is, is very, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and actually, I, this, this just occurred to me as you were, as you were talking. So, you know, thinking from, you know, the community of people that we have gathered here, again, like in my position as, as an assistant professor here at the Annenberg here, in my house <laughs> um, at the Annenberg School um, virtually. Um, you know, we have a lot of um, faculty and students who are interested in thinking about platforms and racial inequality and thinking about technology and different kinds of inequality, um, you know, myself included in that. Um, but one of the things that your work does, which I have always been absolutely fascinated by and I think is really unique is this perspective of ethics that you were mentioning um, in your kind of thinking how, how your research is so tied to like really core anthropological um, ideas. And I wonder, what do you think um, this kind of ethics perspective um, gives us or allows us to see in thinking about the ways that technologies reproduce inequality in various kind of ways um, that we might be missing in our current conversations about these issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's um, I think it's really important to uh, note that there are different ways that you can think about ethics, right? So um, sometimes when we hear the word ethics, we might think of IRBs, rules, boards, right? We might think of these uh, like very prescribed kind of rules and, and principles, right? So um, if we are thinking about, well, what are the ethics of platforms? Um, one way to think about it would be like, okay, there are these data platforms, what rules do we need to develop to sort of govern the proper or the ethical um, use and development of these platforms? And that is of course sort of one piece and, and I think a reasonable way to think about it. But I think a more expansive and more interesting uh, or an alternate way to kind of think about ethics and often how I think about ethics is in, uh, is in this sense of uh, how do we, um, and, and again, it sort of comes back to power for me, right? So first of all, um, when we're thinking about ethics, who is getting to sort of ask the questions about who's sort of setting the terms of what's right or what's wrong? And that very question of, okay, um, is this, you know, is this platform ethical? 
that immediately to me, you have to sort of bring in uh, other concerns about social hierarchies, power, right? Because the way that you know whether or not something is ethical or not, right, sort of depends on all of these other factors. So even a common ethical issue like privacy, right? Like, so say you wanted to say, well, all right, we want to make sure that our data platform is ethical and that it's secure, it, you know, protects users' privacy, right? But we know that privacy um, is something that is not evenly experienced across different groups, that is not available across different groups, that means different things to different groups, right? So, um, so again, you could take a sort of uh, one view that says, all right, let's just make sure that the privacy is protected, or you could sort of take this step back and say, okay, well, what does privacy actually mean and look like if we sort of um, think about it in terms of, uh, in terms of power, right? Um, and often, you know, privacy, even this concept of privacy, I went to a, a really interesting uh, talk some weeks ago um, by a legal scholar who, you know, said that we have to think about the history of privacy as a concept. And privacy as a concept was really uh, for, to like, uh, protect the property of white men, right? Like that's where privacy um, as a concept really sort of developed. So I think even when sort of saying, okay, let's make sure that our data platform is ethical and make sure that it protects privacy, there's so many layers in there that you uh, that you can interrogate, right? To make sure that your kind of ethical um, analysis of a you know of a platform, let's say, actually touches upon so many different questions that I think are really interesting and central to social, to anthropologists, sociologists, right? Um, so I think it's, um, and, and it's not to say that, I, and again, I don't want to kind of be productive, be reductive or too expansive to say that like, well, all anthropologists are really talking about ethics or vice versa, or sociologists are always talking about ethics and vice versa. But I think that once you, if you take that kind of approach, you really see that um, if you want to get to, um, a sort of socially informed ethics, if you will, those kinds of questions are essential. Yeah, the way the ethics invites, the ethical perspective kind of invites us to ask these larger questions that are often implicit in when we rush to make governance rules, for example, like you said, um, that you know our ideas of fairness are kind of all embedded through those things. And yet they often, those assumptions often remain unquestioned until someone like you comes into the room and says, what are you, what operate, what, what assumptions are you operating with here? Um, I should say too, this is another story um, from Khadija and our, Maya's relationship. We were tasked to putting together, I don't know if you even remember this Khadija. Um, we were tasked with putting together a reading list or a reading group on inequality and digital technology at data and society for some of the research assistants and associates and like other folks who were interested while we were there. And we sat down to put a syllabus together and I was like, okay, here's what digital inequalities is. Here's what it looks like. And Khadija said, I remember you saying, I think we need Rousseau on this syllabus. And what, are, what kind of, in, what is inequality anyways? And I remember being like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is exactly um, the kind of question that I need to be asking myself. And I, I don't, um, we often don't in these, in these conversations, it's often taken for granted. Um, so this really segues really nicely, I think, into the other part of your, um, your career, your approach to your research, but also not just research, the way that you maybe understand your commitments as a scholar um, and the kind of ways that you you use your research to, um, to, to change things, to actually achieve justice um, along these dimensions. So, you know, um, as a part of this uh, postdoc research that, that you did and on this huge um, precision medicine on the hype, the hope and hype, which is also a wonderful way of putting that, the hope and hype of precision medicine, um, you became involved in um, this field, not just as a researcher, but as an advisor, as an active participant in the All of Us um, research program, um, which you know is the largest ever research study that is also a precision medicine study. Um, so I want you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this came about um, and maybe also how you related this role or thought about this role to your scholarship and also to your critique of this field. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so for that for the for that postdoc project, right? Um, we tried to we we wanted to make it comparative. So we were looking at precision medicine research projects that were just emerging. So we looked at the All of Us Research Program because it was the largest. It's uh, funded by the NIH. We also looked at a project, a, a kind of more local version. Uh, NYU had this a human study that was a precision medicine research project. We also looked at um, Google or Verily, I should say Alphabet, not Google, but Verily. Um, Verily's uh, project baseline, which is also a precision medicine research study. So we wanted to look at something in the private sector as well. So we were sort of asking, we're doing interviews and asking questions and, uh, uh, about these three, um, about these three different kinds of projects and others that actually came, there were also some other smaller, uh, uh, precision medicine research projects that, that we, um, that we, uh, investigated as well. And so, you know, we're, my colleague, Michaela Pican and I who worked on the study, were sort of going along, getting interviews, you know, looking at documents, having a great time. And I get a call um, from someone at the NIH that essentially says, you know, so we we kind of heard that you've been asking these questions about precision medicine, about the All of Us Research Program, and uh, you know, the, and about the potential pitfalls, right? And one of the um, one of the interesting things that came out from the interviews that we did was that there really was so much hope, and often sort of in the beginning. Uh, when Mikhail and I would do interviews and we kind of come to the part of the interview where we'd say, okay, this all sounds great, but like what could go wrong? You know, sometimes people were sort of taken aback, right? And they were like, well, what do you mean? Or and not, not in a naive way, but you know, that the project hadn't even really gotten off the ground yet. And these were, you know, these were good actors. These weren't bad, bad actors in a sense, right? These, there wasn't a profit motive here. And so um, I, I think for some, it was really kind of, uh, not what they were kind of thinking about, right? Like what could go wrong with the study, but this was really important for us to sort of uh, uh, do this kind of um, anticipatory, Alondra, uh, Alondra Nelson has called this, I, I believe anticipatory social science, right? Where you're like, and you want to think about what the problems um, will be kind of ahead of time. And so I get this call, you know, basically saying like, hey, we heard you've been asking questions about like how this is gonna go wrong. Um, do you want to help us to make sure that it doesn't go wrong um, by joining the Institutional Review Board, the IRB? And, um, and this was for the All of Us Research Program. And, you know, this wasn't, it, it wasn't an easy decision initially because um, I really was invested as, you know, a, as a researcher, as an observer, as uh, someone sort of on the outside, um, you know, lending a sort of critical eye to this field. Um, and so I wondered about how being involved like this, being involved in the IRB might, um, might interfere with my, uh, you know, my critical research <laughs> goals, right? Um, but after some uh, thinking and talking with uh, people there and, 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 other colleagues, I realized that, you know, I had, I sort of had this thought of like, well, what is research for, right? And I don't want to get into this discussion of like, well, basic research and should research be applied, et cetera. But I really, for me at the time thought, all right, well, I'm doing this research. What is it for? I'm doing it because I want to highlight, identify um, some of the vulnerabilities in this emerging field before it becomes wide, widespread, right? Because so much of what I know the environment that we were immersed in at Data and Society was so many of our great fantastic colleagues were looking at uh, pitfalls of technology that had already happened, right? And even at Data and Society, they were still sort of on the vanguard, but these mistakes had already been made, right? So I, you know, I really had to consider and say, you know, if, if my goal here is to kind of make sure this field doesn't end up like compass or, you know, predictive policing or whatever, right? Um, totally different field, but that you kind of get the point that I'm, I'm making, you know, then how can I, how can I do that, right? My research is, is one way, but there are other ways as well. And perhaps um, being a part of the project in this way could be, uh, 
uh, could be a way for me to make that kind of intervention, right? Um, and I do think that it, uh, I, I do think that it falls into a tradition of engage. So in, in anthropology, of course, there's applied anthropology, but there's also, also this larger tradition of, of engaged scholarship, right? Um, and I do think that my participation on the IRB falls into this tradition of engaged scholarship. Um, I do think also because of uh, just the structure of the IRB that it is actually a, a really separate body. And once I participated it, participated in it and I saw that, okay, this IRB isn't just a kind of uh, rubber stamp kind of institution, right? Um, as some have critiqued IRBs as being, you know, not really having any teeth, not really having power, just kind of um, being the rubber stamp for research projects. I, I, I really saw that the, the people on this IRB um, no one is employed by the NIH, no one's careers depend on the IR, uh, on the NIH, right? So people are, it, the structure is set up in a way that people can really, IRB members can really voice their critiques and concerns um, in a strong way. And we have some very strong uh, voices on the IRB that, that, do, that do just that. And so I see um, and, and through my participation, I've sort of seen um, the program change based on, you know, actual recommend recommendations that I and my other colleagues have made. So, um, and this also kind of gets back to a debate within anthropology, right? Our um, discipline is based on participant observation and, you know, I, anthropologists know that as you're participating, you are changing your field of study as you're studying it anyway, right? So there's no way to actually be this disembodied um, outsider that's actually just studying the field but not changing it. So, um, and so of course there's different levels and different ways. So you're going to change the field, right? Um, you, my hope is that I can like change this field for the better, that's why I'm interested in it. Um, and so to me, I sort of see this as, as one, of, one of the ways of doing that. Do you uh, t do you find yourself taking field notes during IRB meetings? So it's funny <laughs> that you should ask that question. So one of the kind of agreements that I did make when I joined the IRB is that they were like, okay, you're really joining as an IRB member, like not as an observer, not as like an anthropologist. So mm -hmm. no, I don't take field notes, but I do take meeting notes. I do take notes as I do on you know every meeting that I take, and of course. I am an anthropologist, so my critical eye, I feel like, is never closed. So it, there are some interesting um, observations that I've just sort of made about the politics of the program and of the IRB itself. But no, in my role, that was sort of one of the things I think initially um, was that I you know I would be there specifically kind of not with my um, hmm. anthropologist hat on, but it, uh, it as an IRB member. But I mean, really, I think my I'm not totally not an anthropologist as I'm there because part of why they wanted me there is for my uh, critical look at the field, right? So I'm always still, um, you know, the, the critical social scientist there when I, you know, I'm looking at applications and things like that. So I guess it's not, it's, you know, I'm not taking field notes and I'm not going to publish an ethnography of my time on the IRB. I don't have time, you know, plans to do that at this point. But, you know, I would read that it, just FYI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, is it totally separate? I'd say not, you know, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And, and thank you so much, too, for sharing that kind of like background, too. I think it's, you know, uh, as, you know, as scholars, especially in these areas of, you know, emerging technologies, like you said, you know, we're often seen as kind of being on the vanguard or, you know, kind of being this. Um, ethical or critical check on some of these systems. And so oftentimes, you know, our students may be in the position or even some of the faculty members also have already experienced this, be in the position of, you know, being invited to go from being observers to being um, engaged in, in these regula regulatory bodies or in providing advice or consultation or governance, you know, strategies or whatever it is. And um, just kind of hearing you say about like what those agreements can look like and you know how you kind of position yourself as an 
outsider within or an insider outsider, you know, all these different types of positionalities that we can take, um, I think is really helpful. And to just hear how, how that deliberation goes, goes on. Um, so I want to be mindful of, yeah, go ahead, please. I just want to just add quickly to that, to that point, especially because you brought up sort of, uh, students and, um, thinking about picking research sites and Mm -hmm. areas and, um, sort of knowing a little bit of the background of the of the some of the comm students, um, I think in, in your program, you know, uh, it that comment reminded me of a piece by um, I believe it's Nancy Shepard Hughes, who's an anthropologist, where she sort of relays the story of of doing fieldwork in Brazil for many years, and then one time kind of going back to the field and her um, informants saying, kind of sitting her down and being like, all right, Nancy, like, what are you going to do for us now? You know, <laughs> like, you're, you're doing this research, but like, you have all of this power and privilege. Um, how are you going to use it on our behalf, right? And it was this sort of moment of tension of like, oh, but, you know, will this kind of sacrifice my position as the um, ethnographer, but yet I do have relationships with these people. And um, and so I think it's, it's, it's something for kind of students as they're thinking about their research uh, questions and topics, right, to think about, well, is this a site where I would be ready um, or compelled to engage in other ways, right? Like, would I be ready to engage um, in other ways outside of doing my own research on, you know, on behalf of the people that I'm working with, studying with inter- interlocutors, et cetera, right? And I think that could actually be a good way for um, if students are maybe having trouble sort of thinking about research questions or deciding um, kind of directions to go in. Um, and again, like the research, the research is central, um, but I think that could be an interesting question to sort of help um, help with that research question site selection potentially which is yeah top of mind I know for many of our Mm -hmm. students right now and always um this actually also reminds me of another big kind of topic that I wanted to make sure that we get to and we are running out of time a little bit and I, I will save a bit of time um at the end to make sure um there are time for questions either in voice or in the chat and again a reminder to to type those questions in the chat or to kind of um chat raise your hand let me know indicate in the chat that you have a question so I can call on you um is this uh, not just the what of your research, right? That you kind of, you've overviewed your research areas. You've talked about the way that you kind of um, engage in engaged research, the way that you think about your research as having obligations to, to the fields that you were actually studying. And now I kind of wanted to save a couple minutes at the end to talk about the how of your research, right? As like a fellow methods nerd, um, kind of talking about the ways that you invite incredibly diverse ways of knowing um, into your research projects. Um, And I don't mean that just in terms of, um, you know, the way that you sit on the IRB and are kind of thinking about your role there as an insider, although we've talked about that, but also um, the ways that you collaborate really widely with people who do not share your epistemology in terms of what social science is good for, what kinds of questions are important to ask and answer, you know, people like, um, I'm I'm sure I'm going to say this wrong, but like kidney specialists and the community support folks and the, you know, uh, clinic, clinical professionals, um, computer scientists, more recently, we were just talking about um, in one of our prep conversations. Um, And so I'd love to hear um, you talk about a little bit, like, when you think about this, these fields that you've dedicated your career to so far, right? Like is, you know, addressing this issue of racial inequality in health and achieving health justice, right? Like whatever that um, ideal might be. Um, Are we obligated as social scientists or do we need to think about methods and collaboration in a different kind of way if we are going to truly move needles on these issues? And how do you kind of think about that when it comes to your research? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that question because it also kind of relates to, so a thought that I had about the previous question about uh, sort of being ready to um, engage in one's research site in different ways. And it's funny because I I relayed the story um, from an anthropologist working in Brazil, but I think also for 
people who are sort of researching um, or and studying setting up, if you will, um, expect that also ex, you know the experts that you're studying may ask you for you know your assistance as well. Um, so and I think and so it connects to this kind of interdisciplinary interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary field work that there are politics there as well, right? So um, as a social scientist, there are sort of hierarchies between the social scientists and the social sciences and the natural sciences that are still there, right? Let's keep it real. Um, and there are questions, like I remember being questioned um, in my field site when I was doing my dissert dissertation research by um, some uh, genomic scientists saying, okay, when I sort of explained what I was doing, that I was going to be observing the team, and they said, well, how do your advisors like know that what you're saying is true? Like, how do they validate? What's the validation process for anthropology, right? And um, it was just one of these questions, right, that he was just like, I mean, I don't understand how this is like real science when this is just, or, you know, these are sort of based on your observations. Um, and so it's, it's part of that process is sort of learning uh, the logics and the language of uh, other fields, um, learning, um, seeing how those sort of disciplinary politics play out um, in while you're doing field work research or if you're actually doing um, interdisciplinary research as well, right? So I, and sometimes those things happen at the same time that you're sort of doing research and you're also collaborating with your um, with your interlocutors at the same time. Um, that was part of uh, part of my experience. But you know, even outside of kind of doing field work, I do engage um, and do writing and research across disciplines, which um, which is very fulfilling. I think it's very interesting, but it's it's tough, right? So there are moments where you have to sort of learn the language, you have to um, learn the politics, and you also have to. Um, but it, but it's been exciting because I think for me it's provided opportunities to really distill what the contribution of anthropology really is, right, to these fields where it's like, well, do we, I can, you know, I can run this machine learning algorithm on all of these data, like what, how can you actually help me, right, like what are you going to tell me that's going to help me? Um, so I think that it's pr presented these opportunities to really think about what the contribution for anthropology is. It's also provided me to sort of, um, again, in the tradition of anthropology, we're sort of becoming immersed in a new culture and a new language, right? Getting to sort of learn um, the methods of other disciplines. I see that as also kind of part in this tradition of doing anthropological um, uh, field work. And I also, you know, I'll share a story of, uh, of a, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration um, uh, recently. So I worked with a group of computational epidemiologists. So computational epidemiology is uh, so it's public health, but essentially public health folks who kind of use advanced analytics in their um, uh, epidemiology. And so I worked with a group of uh, computational ep epidemiologists who were interested in uh, seeing who use platforms, who actually use uh, social media platforms for epidemiology. And this is kind of a, a new area of epidemiology, right? How can we use social media data as a source of data about public health? So. Um, uh, this researcher, Elaine and Soasi, she's done some really interesting research on how you can use Yelp reviews to learn about uh, foodborne illness, right? People writing like, oh, I got sick and can you track it, you know, through the reviews, really interesting stuff. Um, so I worked with um, Elaine and some of her colleagues sort of looking at how, our question was, can we learn anything about miscarriage on Twitter using Twitter, people's Twitter posts, right? So because miscarriage is this thing that often people don't talk about is sort of hidden, um, but yet Twitter is this place where people come, you know, come to with and share very private things. Um, perhaps this can kind of shed some new insights on miscarriage if we look at the way that people talk about it on Twitter. And so this was interesting because I, you know, I got to learn some of the kind of quantitative methods that I wasn't trained in, right? But it was this really interesting uh, learning experience, but it also was again, this moment of, um, for me to sort of think about how I, what my contribution would be. And I think it was, you know, initially when I would start some of these interdisciplinary collabor 
collaborations, it would be like, well, we have to turn everything into an ethnography, right? And it's like, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, right? Like everything doesn't have to become an ethnography, but there are different ways along, even within a kind of very quantitative sort of process that you can, as an anthropologist, social scientist, communication scholar, right, that you can make contributions. So for me, it was really sort of how we frame some of the questions how we read some of the literature that framed the questions um, for us, and even at how we kind of interpret interpreted um, the data that we got from um, from those tweets. So, you know, it wasn't an ethnographic study. We didn't publish an ethnographic study, but I, I do feel like you know my contribution was important and, and and valued by other you know by the other members of the team as well. So um, so yeah. So I guess the kind of short answer there is that I think this interdisciplinary work is sort of like, again, within the tradition of anthropology. And there's also different ways, there's different ways to do it. It doesn't look, it doesn't necessarily have to look, um, look like the, look the same every time, if you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I know, you know, even among the students who are here and the faculty as well, that increasingly kind of multimodal or like thinking about how to constitute these teams of researchers who come from very different places, but who are nevertheless trying to illuminate, um, you know, patterns and data together, um, that that's something that a lot of people are thinking about how to, how to kind of come together across very different um, very different epistemologies. Um, so we do have a couple minutes left and I do have one question in the chat, wonderful question from um, Michael Deli Carpini, who's wondering about, um, and Michael, I'm just gonna read your question because you typed it out, I hope that's okay. Um, how well received is the idea of engaged scholarship, public scholarship or public interest scholarship within anthropology? Um, and is it something that emerging scholars can do without risking tenure and promotion in your experience, Khadija? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I'm still uh, <laughs> sort of learning that myself. I mean, as I said before, I think there is a really robust tradition of engaged scholarship, public, you know, sort of being a public intellectual in anthropology, and I think in sociology as well. Um, so, but that I, I think it really depends on the department that you're trained in. I think it depends on the department that you end up in because, and, and also things like you can be a public intellectual, you can be an engaged anthropologist, let's say, but are you publishing in um, equally in academic and public facing outlets or are you mostly publishing in, um, again, if you want to get tenure, let's say, right? Um, or are you mostly publishing in, um, you know, public um, uh, public outlets? And mm -hmm. so that makes a difference, right? So um, at the end of the day, I think it's your, you know, your publication record is is what your research and publications, that's what kind of uh, makes your case. And so if you're able to do that while also um, engaging in other ways, I think for many anthropologists I know who who I would consider engaged scholars, I mean, it's sort of this, uh, they're, engaged scholar, they're engaged work in their field site. So there's, again, like a, a history of activist anthropology. They're in, you know, their involvement in, um, uh, uh, in kind of activist movements or in other uh, fights for justice, et cetera, then uh, those activities then inform their research questions and their next field sites. And, so it's not necessarily something that's separate from your work. And I think the engaged or public intellectuals who do that the best from what I see are the ones where that it's not sort of two separate spheres that they're um, operating in that the, the two sort of really inform each other. And they also make sure that they kind of, you know are on track in terms of the publication and research and the other kind of standards for their department. But it's not that they sort of think about these things that they do with you know, community groups or with their experts or on boards that's kind of separate from mm -hmm. the questions that they're thinking about that it actually helps inform uh, their research and scholarship. I think too, just to like add to that is, you know, we're talking about inequality here, we're talking about racial inequality and like this larger issue, you know, we're talking about it in terms of how it is reproduced or co-produced through science and technology, but also, this is how these inequalities happen in the academy as well, right? And I think we need to kind of be mm -hmm. honest about that, that like the people who are often coming into the academy with these interests who are, you know, hired because of these interests, because they're invested in 
solving these big problems of, you know, racial injustice, health justice, right? Like gender, whatever it might be, are essentially doing double duty, right? That they, they are, you know, it's it, like you said, like it's, it's fine to do public scholarship as long as this other kind of scholarship is, 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 um, is still there. But if you see those things as inextric inextricably linked in the way that you come up with your research questions and the, and the kinds of things you get excited about, essentially it is a burden and, uh, you know, an invisible burden. Public scholarship becomes an unrewarded um, burden for especially junior scholars who are interested in this kind of work. So I think it's kind of important to air that and to just say, you know, let's work on it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'm really happy you brought that up. And I want to just, you know, underscore that as well, that, you know, part of this, it, 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 we definitely have to bring up sort of uh, institutional and departmental politics around what kind of work gets valued and, uh, yeah, and what sort of appearances and, yeah, are, are valued. And there is often this, like you said, these sort of conflicting uh, demands to uh, be the scholar that's, you know, the, um, the person that's sort of showing the department's commitment to racial justice or studying racial inequality, but yet um, the kinds of work or engaged um, uh, scholarship that's being done to sort of, again, enhance that person's research uh, agenda, let's say, um, if those things are sort of, again, internally looked down upon or not given uh, support in many ways from sort of support of mentors to financial support, et cetera, right? Then it's like, that can create a big mm -hmm. conflict. So mm -hmm. um, it's sort of, I, I think part of, if we're really serious about um, addressing racial inequality in the academy as well, and wanting to really study these um, issue seriously, there has to be some of this inward looking at the um, the politics of the institutions and the politics of departments at the same time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, and that that burden often falls on scholars of color, especially junior scholars of color, right, to do that kind mm -hmm. of work. Um, so, thank you very much, Michael, for that, and Michael saying thank you in the chat. Um, and I'm I'm fully aware, you know, for those of you who need to go, um, please you know, please go if you need to go. Um, we're at the end of our time, but um, I have been told that we can have a few extra minutes. Um, if there are other questions, I would love to hear them. Um, and whether they're about engaged scholarship, whether they're about um, any of the kind of technologies that um, Khadija is looking at, or maybe some of the platform politics of this issue with Google, I'm fascinated to hear more about that. Um, I would love to hear those now, either in the chat or um, to just like volunteer yourself and unmute yourself. All right, maybe not. Um, okay, well, Khadija, um, thank you so, so much um, for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, I may fun. rope you into future conversations about thinking about engaged scholarship, about methods, about in incorporating, you know, critical social science into, you know, different kinds of modes of, of thinking. I know that's a constant kind of topic of conversation between us. Um, and thank you so much for contributing your expertise and for, um, you know, showing us the background of of how careers get built um, in thinking about these kinds of research questions. It's really, really important. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for spending the time today. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, this was great. And I'm really happy that we got to cover, like you said, the what and also the how, um, because I think for me, um, and, and like you said, I think there were some students out here um, in, in the audience. I think it's really important to sort of paint that picture of, um, uh, how how you um, how you can build a research career um, kind of from different paths and how those interests right I think um, my earlier interests in policy have sort of come back um, mm -hmm. to my work uh, now sort of sort of all comes together right so I think one message one takeaway message for maybe if again if there are students out there that if you have this what seem like disparate interests um, don't be too worried about those right and you may have to kind of focus on 
um, a few things for your, uh, narrow those down for your dissertation research, right? But don't throw those, uh, those interests away, right? And that experience, those experiences that you have, um, because later in your career, you can kind of bring those back in and, and connect them in really interesting ways. So, um, so yeah, well, this was, uh, this was really fun. Um, thank you. And thank you to everyone that helped make this possible. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Khadija. And I'll call you later. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye. weekend. Thank you. Bye.